So I want you to grab your Bible. Uh, if you have one, I want you to open it to Mark chapter 12. And while you're doing that, I'm going to ask for a favor. Will you help me welcome our correctional facility campus? Come on, let's tell all the guys at ERDCC how much we love them. Incredible, incredible group of guys there. Um, so today, I thought it'd be fun to do a sermon on the most controversial topic I could come up with. Um, I want to start a new series that speaks to this election we're going into called Disciples in a Democracy. And I, I know this may be a surprise to some of you that God is even interested at all in government. And I think a lot of people believe that God wants nothing to do with government, and they see a strong kind of chasm between him and what happens in a nation. But scripturally speaking, um, you cannot read the Bible and come to that conclusion. As a matter of fact, um, there are whole, whole books of the Bible dedicated to nothing but how a nation operates. There's laws and kings and queens. There's um, ordinances and statutes. It, to, to read the scripture is to recognize that God cares about the individual and the nation at the exact same time. And I want to I say this, that, that for us, what my hope is, is that we would recognize the same Bible we're looking to for our individual lives, for how to function and how to find God's favor, is just as relevant for a nation to function and find God's favor. And my goal is really to help you get a worldview of what does it look like to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus in a democracy, what is it that that looks like? So I'm going to be doing it for just two weeks, but um, today I really feel like that I, what I've got to do is address that the fact that this season has come upon us. And that you may be suffering from something I call election infection, okay? Election infection is a specific virus that really spreads every two to four years in our country. It's when our thinking gets clouded, our passions get a little much. Often it affects our mouths that start to speak ugly towards one another. It'll cause you to turn on people. And, and if we're not careful, it really reveals a shakiness to our faith. And I wish I could tell you it's easy to avoid, but turns out it's not. Because in this season, the rhetoric is at an all-time high. The commercials are nonstop. You know, the, the, the claims that if you do this, it can save a nation. And if you do that, it can answer all the problems. And all those emails you're getting from your crazy uncle about the candidate he wants to choose, all of that comes together and starts to just really infect our own hearts. And, and, and it's not just the fact that it's this season, but it's also the reality that we have real problems as a, as a nation. I mean, racial tensions are as high as they've ever been. We cannot get a hold of poverty. Terrorism looms, and in addition to that, moral decay seems to be going at a more rapid pace than ever before. And so it's in all of this that our hearts easily become jaded. As a matter of fact, an NBC News poll came out and asked people how they felt about the, the season that we're in. Overwhelmingly, people gave two words. Here were the words, fed up. That for most of us, it feels like a, a, something to endure versus the hope-filled future that we once thought that our nation had. And so it's with that that I want to encourage you today, and I actually want to help you kind of take the Bible and, and, and understand what is a worldview for a believer in this. But I also want to just encourage you that this is not new, that in fact, Jesus himself faced what you're facing. In Mark chapter 8, starting with verse 13, there's this moment where Jesus is pulled into the political world. And I want to show you how he navigated it and some insights he gave us. Mark 12, 13, they, uh, then they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to him in order to trap him in a state. They came and said to him, teacher, we know that you are truthful and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. So then they asked him a question, is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius. Now, a denarius was a coin. And he says, I want you to look at the image and inscription. Whose is it? And they said, it's Caesar's. So in the same way you would take a quarter and see George Washington's inscription or an image on it, they're saying, look, look at this denarius, and it is a Caesar's image on it. 
And so Jesus then answered and said, pay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. And they were utterly amazed at him. Now, l- let me tell you kind of what's going on. Two groups of people on opposite ends of the spectrum have come to Jesus. They both represent the Jewish community, but they're left and right. You see, the Jewish community at this point is um, they're oppressed by the Roman government as Rome really rules the known world. And this tax fell on different ways that they saw it. I mean, think about it. Are we funding our oppressors or should we stand in protest is what they're asking. And each one of these groups had a different view, a conservative view and a liberal view. So they come to Jesus as he has growing influence and they ask him, should we pay this tax? But here's really what they're asking. Whose side are you on? Because in the political understanding, there's only two sides. So Jesus does something brilliant. He does not pick a side, but he elevates what's taking place. What he, he steps back and he shows them is that, in fact, we're not picking sides, but this is a test to where my confidence lies. And that's the reason he doesn't just say, just pay the tax or don't pay the tax. He says, you go ahead and give Caesar what's Caesar's, but my confidence is in God, and I report ultimately to him, as does Caesar. And it's in this moment that Jesus reveals a couple things to us. The first one is this, is that 2,000 years later, that's what politics is doing to us. It's really drawing us into an argument that says there are only two sides, and it's testing our hearts. In this season, your heart is being tested by its allegiances, your maturity is being tested, your words are being tested, your biblical literacy is being tested. And ultimately, what you and I have to recognize is, ever so slightly, our hope starts to be put in a political stance and away from Christ. And it's in these moments we have to wake up and recognize that maybe we've been infected by this election. Now, um, I I got sick a couple weeks ago. I don't like to make habit of it. I don't get sick often, but I have five kids. That's like living in a Petri dish, okay? And I'm just gonna be honest, when I get sick, I get dramatic, okay? You've ever heard of a man cold, you know? Um, well, I had, well, I, when, when I get sick, I start singing songs about heaven. I, I tell Kayla, you know, how to cash in the life insurance. Like, I just assume I'm dying, and she just rolls her eyes, you know? But, but here's the thing. When you're sick, here's what you and I know. You never delay in the sin. Once you recognize you're sick, you, you try to act fast, because here's what you and I know. The quicker that you're diagnosed, the quicker you can be prescribed something to help. And so one of the reasons we're even doing this at this point in this journey is because I want to quickly help you recognize what's coming in this season. But I also want to help you diagnose that maybe your heart has been infected. Now, I'm not going to diagnose it. I'm going to let you do it. Because when you go to any doctor, here's what they're going to do. They're going to determine what infection you have by asking questions. So what I've done in today's message is I have four questions that you're going to ask yourself. And these four questions are going to help you discern has my heart become infected by this election season? And really what you're asking is, is my worldview one of politics or one of, that's established by God's word? Okay? So here's the, the very first one, first question you need to ask yourself. Does my faith come before my political affiliation? Now, um, the telltale sign that you may be struggling with election infection is that you would hold this belief, or even say this, the church shouldn't have anything to do with politics. Some of you in this moment, even in your own internal, here's what you've thought, you shouldn't be preaching this message. And and what you're saying is, I understand that's an opinion, and, and, and I respect it, but let me say what you're really saying in a broader sense. Here's what you're saying. There's a separation between the secular and the spiritual. That some things are secular and some things are spiritual and that they should be a car mentalized. People who hold this view, here's, here's what they, God's laws and the laws Congress passes have nothing to do with each other. And, and then if you drive it down even a level deeper, here, here's what they're saying personally is, I have a work life and I have a church life, but these are not meant to be mixed. And then if you drive it down deeper, these are the people who will, will easily say, we want God at the wedding, but we don't want him to tell us how to be married. We want him to bless our finances but we don't want him to tell us how to steward them. Ultimately, what you have come to the conclusion of, there's some things you want God's opinion on, and there's other things you don't. Now, this is common. It's a common belief. But l- let me just say, it's just not scriptural. 
Let, let me show you. Colossians 3, verse 4. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Now, let, let me just point out what it did not say. It did not say, and Christ, who's a portion of your life. And Christ, who's a part of your life. It says, and Christ, who is your life. Here's what it's saying. For the people who are following Scripture, following Christ biblically, he's your life. Your parenting is in Christ. Your, your career is in Christ. Your marriage is in Christ. Your attitudes are in Christ. How you treat people is in Christ. Your money management is in Christ. Your politics are in Christ. That's what it's saying. Now, um, the problem, I think, is for many people is they want to disconnect Christ from certain parts of their life. But here's what happens. Here's the cost. Whenever we disconnect Christ from a part of our life, we take the life from that section because it's Christ who is your life. That, let me say it this way. When you dis disconnect Christ from a part of your life, it begins to die. And you just can't have the abundant life Christ offers without giving him your whole life. And, and so I wonder, could it be that the negative trends that we are experiencing as a nation are because we disconnected from Christ? Now, I don't think that's just a, a question or opinion. I think there could be some substantiation. For example, 1962, prayer was removed from public schools. In 1963, reading the Bible every day was removed from public schools. Okay? So since 1963, uh, unwed pregnancies, STDs, and um, incarcerations have skyrocketed. Since 1963, um, divorce rates have doubled. And since 1963, violent crime in our country is up 200%. Now, let me point this out. Since 1963, both parties have had power. Since 1963, we've had a varied number of candidates and leaders. And many different laws, both conservative and liberal, have been passed. Yet, our decline continues because I believe we're disconnected from Christ. That's why it's so important, so important. That when you and I, as followers of Jesus, walk into this season, what we recognize is faith before any other affiliation. So, so let me say it this way. You are a Christian before you're a Republican. You are Christian, then Democrat. You are, you are Christian, then Republican. Let me say it this way. I'm not an American who's a Christian. I'm a Christian who happens to be an American. Because it is that allegiance to heaven that informs every other allegiance that follows. Okay, now, now let me just say, if you happen to be one of these people who, who you just don't agree with that, and you kind of have this compartmentalization idea of like, nope, nope, this, separate, nope. Okay, let, let me just say, there's an irony in what you're saying. Okay, as a pastor, I've had the opportunity to stand um, by bedsides when people um, are leaving this world. And what's interesting to me is that people who struggle to keep Christ first in their life always do it at the end of their life. Like, I've never been standing there and they say, Pastor, will you read me the Constitution? <laughs> One more time, I'd like to hear the Bill of Rights. You know why? Because at the end of life, it becomes very clear whose life. It becomes very clear. And the things that we separated clearly fade. And the one who matters steps forward. And, 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 and I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just saying this. What you're saying in that they should be, it just it doesn't make sense. Why would you trust God with your eternity and not your country? What, why would you say, you can have my heart, but not my community? So one of the first things you got to figure out is, hey, where's my faith in the process of this? Okay, here, here's the second one. Um, do I love people more than policy? Um, nearly every news outlet, and we would all agree, our country is more divided than ever before. I mean, we're, we're very divided, I and mean, we're spending billions of dollars to make sure we're divided. Um, 
And as a pastor, I think my concern, not so much for the entire world, but just for you, who, who this is your place, here's my concern, that it seems like we think this season gives us the liberty to say anything about anyone we want. That if, in fact, someone, we disagree with them, we can easily demonize them, and it's not a big deal. That if we're different, and we come from different backgrounds or hold different perspectives, that it all, all becomes like winners and losers and, you know, heroes and villains. And, and all I'm saying in this is, is the idea that we, as followers of Jesus, aren't called to make a statement. We're called to make a difference. And frankly, I just don't really want to hear your opinions on how many people the government feeds if you haven't fed anybody personally in a long time. I'm not interested in your views on education policy, though they are important, if you've not volunteered in a classroom. See, we're not just... It's, it's, there's no special gifting to point out what's wrong. What we are called to be is walk in and provide solutions to help make things right. And, and Jesus said that himself when he said in John 13, 35, by this, all men will know you are my disciples by the way you post on Facebook. <laughs> I'm sorry, that, that's in the Greek. <laughs> said, hey, people are going to know by the way you love. Now, let me just say, there's nothing wrong with opinions. It's just, do people know you more by your opinion than your love is the question. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I got to have dinner with a guy named, um, his name's Dr. Mark Williams. You, you probably don't know who he is, but he actually helps lead one of the largest Christian organizations in the world. About 9 million Christians fall under his leadership. And um, we were having this extended meal with a couple more people, and um, and I just, I mean, he is brilliant theologically. I mean, brilliant. Um, and his ability to communicate, he's one of the best communicators I've personally ever heard. And then he's got all this influence. But here's what I noticed. When I left that meal, I wasn't saying, I want to be smart like him. I, I want to I lead like him. Or I want the influence he has. The craziest thing, naturally, not thinking, just naturally, I walked away and said, man, I want to love more like he loves because at the table, and I'll give you a few examples. We're, we're at a dinner. It's not a homeless shelter, but yet he was loving. You know, like, like he, for example, he asked Kayla and I about us, about our children. He remembered facts about us. It would be so easy for him to make it all about him, yet he made it all about us. And, and then he made other people the star. Uh, it wasn't just us. He made sure every person felt included. Have you, have you ever been around people today that say, hey, I, I want to talk to you? And what they mean is, I want to talk at you. And you sit there and listen the whole time. It was nothing like that. Even though he knew more than all of us and was been entrusted with more than all of us, he made us the star of the show. And it wasn't just us like who hold titles. I mean, the way he spoke kindly, encouragingly to waiters, waitresses. And, and then I watched him hold doors for people. I mean, he's probably worthy of a red carpet, but yet he was holding doors. And then when we got to the Uber, um, what, what we noticed is, is that there was a, a Muslim driver. He didn't focus on us anymore. He began to talk to him, asking about him, investing in him. And I just walked away going, I want to love like that. Now, here, here's why I tell that story, because I want to point out to something you may not know. Love and hate are both contagious. And if you hang out with hateful people, you become more hateful. And if you hang out with loving people, you want to be more loving and you need to know that. So, so let me just say as your pastor, um, in this season, really every season, but this season, it matters what you say. You know, the Bill of Rights gives you a freedom of speech. Scripture does not give you freedom of speech. The Bible says of people who follow Jesus, their mouths should be guarded. So here's what that means. Um, when you're, if you're insulting folks, if you're demonizing if you're, you're um, callously calling, I'm not talking about disagreeing on policy, but callously attacking people, you have stepped outside of Scripture. And then it also matters in this season how you treat people. This may be a, a kind of news, but God never created anyone that he didn't love. He's never created anyone without purpose. He's never created anyone with which Jesus didn't give his life for. Republican. Democrat, left, right, they're all precious in his sight, 
Jesus loves the politicians of the world. Okay. And, and here, here's what I, I want us to set our hearts on as a church. That we're going to care beyond November 5th. Because if we're, if we're not careful, the church can be very guilty of only caring up to the election. And November 5th is election day. So here's what I'm saying. We're going to commit to love up to November 5th and on no, November 6th and beyond. Wait, listen, I just, I'm going to let you in on a little, little plan we got. We're going to take care of single moms after the election. We're going to pray for our teachers and bless them after the election. We're going to feed the hungry after the election. We're going to disciple prisoners after the election. Let Washington change leaders. The church will continue to change the world as long as we love. Okay. Here's the third one. Um, am I apathetic or actively using my voice? Um, I, I don't know if you know this. You are in a very tiny, tiny percentage of the, the people on this planet who get to participate in choosing your leaders. All around the world, very few people get to actually participate in choosing their leaders. And um, I, I, I think that most people today look at voting as a luxury, but here's what the scriptures would teach us. It's a biblical responsibil a responsibility. L let me show it to you in scripture. Proverbs 3.27, do not withhold good from those whom it is due when it is in your power to act. Okay, so, so according to scripture, you've been given this authority or opportunity, and when you use it, it brings good into the lives of people. So, so it is biblically you are responsible because you've been given this to vote. Now, now let me just say this. You say, well, how do I, how do, I do that in balance? And I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about kind of what God cares about, what we should care about next week. But let me just say, at two basic junctions, here's what has to happen. First and foremost, you have to do the work to become informed. Most people who um, today, really, to be honest with you, they vote based on their grandmother's affiliation to a party or just kind of the personality of the candidate. And here's what I need you to think of this. You would not hire somebody at your business based on that. You, like if you were interviewing people, you wouldn't say, I don't care what my grandma thought about you. You, you would not say, well, I, I, it doesn't matter how much I, I like you or what you wear or what you appear as. You would interview them. You would look at their track record. You would see where they stood. You would call references because you would know how serious this person could either make or break you. You would get that. So one of the realities is as believers, we, we have to take time to be informed. To, to interview, if you will, the, these people. But, but let me be clear. Being informed does not mean just knowing the candidates. It means knowing what God wants to do through you. Okay. Um, it's not just showing up and executing my opinion. It's showing up and carrying out God's opinion. And, and I show it to you scripturally. Look at it. Uh, Proverbs eleven eleven. The good influence of, help me with this word, God. godly citizens causes the city to prosper. So, so notice this. It says a specific type of citizen causes, the byproduct of that citizen, the community is blessed. Now notice what, it does not say educated citizens. It doesn't say moral citizens. It doesn't say successful citizens. It says godly citizens. The byproduct of people going in and reflecting God's values and God's agenda causes a community to be blessed. So, so let me be clear what our, our goal is as followers of Jesus. Our goal is to take the person and policies of Jesus and infuse them into our political process so that the person and power of Jesus begins to bless our community. On the other hand, though, when we walk in and don't use the person and policies of Jesus it's no wonder we don't see the person and power of Jesus displayed in our nation. So that's our job is to walk in informed in, the, in that way. But, but let me just say this, that um, that's why the most important question in the election is not who will you vote for. The most important question is this, what does God think? And it's your job and my job as followers of Christ to represent what God thinks on the issue, the policy, the candidate, whatever it is. Now, let me just say, once you become informed, now you're actually going to use that information to make an informed decision to vote. Now, I, I, I think for many of us, voting is something that maybe doesn't take place because we just go, does this even matter? Does this really matter? 
So in our country, there are approximately 60 million people who are self-proclaimed followers of Jesus. Okay, And generally speaking, only about half of them ever participate in an election. So that's 60 million possible, 30 million that participate. So I just thought to myself, I wonder if it would make any difference if the other 30 million showed up. And here's what I found. Every election in U.S. history, whatever the result was, and I'm not, I'm not making a judgment what the result was, but whatever the result was, would have been overturned had the rest or the other half of the Christian community showed up. There is no election that 30 million extra people would have shown up that it wouldn't have turned that election in a different direction. You see, as the church, we're not called to retreat. We're called to redeem. Let me say it this way. Why do you think God left you here? Like, like you could have chosen to follow Jesus and just immediately went to heaven. You'd be having a better time there than here. He left you and I here to do something, to redeem something. And Jesus said it this way in Matthew 5, 14. He said, you are the world's light, a city on a hill glowing in the night for all to see. Here's what he's saying. When the church pulls back, culture pulls people further into darkness. That we are, our presence is what allows light versus darkness to move. You know, now participating biblically is something that I, I, you just have the responsibility clearly in scripture. But I, I want to be honest with you, I, there are other motivations. And so right now, I'm going to tell you one more motivation that I personally hold. Now, I'm going to be clear because I want to I really honor you and honor scripture. What I'm about to share with you has nothing to do with scripture. So my personal motivation. Okay. So I have a biblical responsibility to vote, but I also have personal desires. And here's one of the reasons I want to honor. And I want you and I to be people of honor. So, so let me say it this way. When I'm, uh, when, when election day comes, it's not going to be convenient. I'm going to want to skip the lines, not fight for a parking space, not stand in line. I'm going to be thinking about all the time that I could be using to do something else. And, I'm going to be, and it's going to be easy to just go, ah, oh, this doesn't matter. And it's in that moment that I think I have a biblical responsibility. But here's what else I think. I think about my grandfather who served in World War II. Okay. My grandfather, um, after Pearl Harbor, many of his friends, and he, they went to a recruiter's office to sign up to, be, to join the military. The problem was he was only 17. You have to be 18 to join the military. So he did the patriotic thing, and he lied on his form. Okay. <laughs> then when they went through the, the, the kind of the, the physical, he didn't weigh enough. Okay. So the recruiter said, come back tomorrow, tonight, drink all the milk you can, eat all the bananas you can. And said, come back. He came back the next day. He had gained two pounds, and it was enough for him to be put into the Navy. Okay. I'm glad, to, to all the glory be to God, that my family has overcome the weight issue since he had it, right? <laughs> so he gets shipped to the South Pacific, and um, he's loading ammunition on vessels that are heading into Japan. But I, he's told me all kinds of stories about them being shelled, air raids coming, having to hide. He told me great stories, but he also told me about friends that didn't come home. He told me about men that he was shipped off with that, they, they didn't make it back. And when I'm standing there in a line, annoyed at how long this is taking, it's just really healthy for me to remember the sacrifice that allows me to stand in this line. And what I would encourage you to do is find someone in your community or family, could be from Vietnam, Desert Storm, uh, Afghanistan, but someone who sacrificed for you to have this opportunity and just think, you know what? I'm going to honor them. It is a biblical responsibility but it's also a way to honor those who have allowed us this incredible opportunity. Now, here's the last one. Um, am I a person of panic or prayer? So I'm going to give you four words. Here they are. Ukraine, immigration, inflation, assassination. I mean, that's only four words, and already your pacemakers starting to do over time. <laughs> Right? I mean, I mean, we live in a world that it is undeniable. With four words, we just described four incredibly challenging things we all face and are affected by. And then that doesn't count that in the next few months, they will spend billions of dollars with fear-filled messages because they found out that we move better based on fear than on hope, and they are going to flood us with every worst-case scenario possible. It is, it is undeniable a time when anxiety will rule. And for you and I, we have to ask ourselves, is that okay? 
Now, here's what Scripture says. God says in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, he says, um, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Here's what he's saying. I never work through fear. You'll never hear my voice in fear. I work through peace. So if you and I are guided by fear, we're not following Jesus. Okay? So then what do we do? It's not like you can just not care. Here's what you do. You pray. Prayer is not something we do to keep God happy. Prayer is a gift God gave us to relieve fear. It's like a relief valve. As your heart builds with anxiety, you can pray and it relieves fear. And here's why. When you and I pray, it takes our minds off what we're worried about and puts it back on God's abilities. Like we, we stop looking at all the government problems and we remember God has a plan, that, that we're no longer our hopes in this elected official, now it's on Jesus. And, um, and, and it's just something you're going to have to use again and again. For example, like many of you, I joined the 51 million uh, people and watched the last presidential debate. And then I did something so stupid. I went to social media to see what people were thinking. <laughs> so stupid. I mean, you, you get on there and everybody's opinions and, and the fear and the theories. and the, I mean, so stupid. <laughs> And like, I could feel my heart starting to race. And they're like, oh my God. Because let's be honest, we, we were at a place where, I mean, it is kind of feel like we're getting close to the cliff. And it, it does feel like we're on eggshells a bit. And then at any moment, something could happen that, that, that really could shift in a detrimental way. It feels that, and you start feeling it. And I saw one person post, and here's what they post. What is the world coming to? And I, in a minute, I, 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 I don't know, but I feel that. And then out of his grace, all of a sudden, I sense the Holy Spirit raise a Scripture in my mind. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. What is the world coming to? The world's coming to this. The world is coming to a place where arrogance and idolatry and greed and injustice will end and we will enter into the reign of Jesus Christ. And his meekness and his kindness and his generosity and his might will no longer be challenged. We are coming to the day when a healthcare system is not needed because he will heal all. We are coming to a day when there will be no need for a national defense as he has dispelled evil. We're coming to a day when there's no longer economic stimulus that has to be passed because out of him he will provide all that is needed for every person. This passage is referring to the, de the moment, the day, when every knee will bow in an attestment that Jesus is who he said he is and he did what he said he did. And it is every knee, I mean every person of every Every nationality and ethnicity and age and religion, every scientist and every, uh, every person who's ever walked as a stay-at-home mother or as a pro athlete, a celebrity or, or a dictator, they will all unanimously with their knees cast the ballot that says he is the one who is the ruler above all in an every way. And universally, their tongues will confess him as Lord. That means that they will announce for all and forevermore, no more elections, no more recounts, no more debate. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, that his throne is set on righteousness and justice for all time, for all people, and to eternity forever. And it's in that, it's in that, that fear is gone and peace is restored. That's what it means to live in a kingdom and in a country at the exact same time. Peace overrides chaos. Now let me say this, that for you and I, this is also a reminder that the most important leadership decision you will ever make is not who runs this country, but who leads your life. Because on this day I just described, there will be two very clear experiences. There won't even be a third, it'll just be one or the other. There will be a people who are full of joy and a people who are full of regret. Those who are full of joy 
will recognize that choosing to follow Christ has now afforded them eternity with Christ. And those full of regret will realize that they settled for something lesser. And because of that, the chaos they've endured is nothing to the chaos that's coming. And so as much as I want you to represent Christ in what we do as a nation more, I want you to decide Christ is the one whom leads your life despite what happens in a nation. So I want you to stand to your feet today. And I, I would ask, just because I, I, I just sense that this is such a clarity that God's given us in this moment, would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? And, and, and I'm just asking you to do this as a moment of reflection, to put out the people beside you and to consider what God may be saying to you. So here's what I believe. I think there are some of you here today in this, this moment who you're just honest people. Now, here, here's what I mean by honest. You're just honest enough and bold enough. You've never considered yourself someone who fakes it. You, you don't consider yourself someone who puts on. And you're just honest enough in this moment to go, Pastor Joe, I'm not sure which side of that I will end up on. I, I'm just going to be cards on the table. I don't know where my relationship with God is. It's not that I don't appreciate him or have an affinity for him, but it's like when you say he's leading my life, when you're saying a, a, a relationship with him, not just like some distance thing, when you say I'm certain about on that day which crowd I'll be in, I, I'm just going to be honest, I don't know. First of all, let me thank you for your honesty. In a world full of fake, thank you so much for just being clear about you don't know. And let me just say that if you're here and you, you just say, I don't know, but I want to be certain that following Jesus is as simple as one decision. That's the craziest thing about this whole deal. I, I just can't get over it. To follow Jesus, you don't have to go out and take a class. You don't have to go do 10 good things and I come back and give you a card. You make one decision that Jesus is who he said he was, did what he said he did, and from that you choose to say, I'm his follower. And you just say, you live out that decision every single day. In every single decision and instance, you do that. It's the craziest thing. You are his and he is yours. And you begin to receive an abundant life on earth, scripture says, and an eternal life forever with him. So if you're here today, I, I, I want to pray for you if that's the decision you're making. Now, listen, I'm, I'm not going to embarrass you. Everybody's considering their own life in this moment. But I also don't want to just pray some, you know, boxed prayer over a crowd of people. I want to pray for you. This is a big deal for you. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, if you're here today and you say, Pastor Joe, pray for me. I'm choosing. I'm making this decision in my own heart to follow Jesus. I'm making this decision today. I'm, I'm taking my in, my, my, honestly, my lack of clarity, and I'm making a decision to make this clear that I'm a follower of Jesus. I want to pray for you. So let's do this. I, I, I want to just put a prayer with your face. So would you just do this? Would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor Joe, pray for me today. I'm choosing to follow Jesus. Just real high, real high. Pastor Joe, pray for me today. I'm choosing to follow Jesus. I see that hand. I see that one. Yes, ma'am. I see that one in the back. Pastor Joe, pray for me today. Yep, I see you. I see you. Yep, yep, yep. Real high. Pastor Joe, pray for me today. I see those two, those two, that one. Yep, that one over there. Pastor Joe, pray for me today. I'm choosing to follow Jesus. I see you four up there. I see you. Yes, sir, I got you back there. I got you. All right, here's what I want to do. I, um, I want to help you put some words to what's going on in your heart. I went to Scripture, and I pulled out some um, kind of just some, some things that could help you know what you're saying and, and, and it line up with Scripture. Now, I, we're going to put it on screen, and on the count of three, we're going to pray it together. Listen to me very clearly. You are not repeating this to me. You are praying this to your Heavenly Father. I'm just, I'm just giving you a little language to help, that's all. So I want to make sure you, you're not just, you know, just, this is not a chant. This is not like a, just recite it and it's done. This is just me giving you some words to pray, because I know that may be a challenge. So um, here's what I want to do on the count of three. I want us to pray it together out loud. Here we go. One, two, three. Heavenly Father, I admit that I'm a sinner and that I'm lost without you. I believe Christ died in my place, making a way for us to have a relationship. I choose to follow Jesus and his way for the rest of my life. Father, I pray right now for every single person. According to scripture, they're a new creation. Their spirit is new. And that, what that means, Father, is that they, they're just going to be set on new direction. They're going to have new affections, new appetites, and it's all going to be toward you. So I pray that, that, God, they would experience a fresh peace, 
I pray that it would last and that joy would be their disposition. That God, over the next few days, they're just going to feel like, for lack of a better way to say it, they're going to feel like they've been washed from the inside. And so, God, I just pray that that fresh forgiveness and that, that new relationship with you would just set them on course. I pray they'd never, ever, ever be the same. Now, God, it's a journey, so I pray you'd bring people around them to encourage them, help us be the church they need. But, Lord, I pray they'd never be the same in Jesus' name. And, Father, I pray for every single person here that their hearts, my heart, would be pure before you. That, Father, we would see you first, our allegiance to you over all others. And that, God, we, at the end of this season, here's my prayer, that we would say we honored you. We honored Jesus with our words. We honored Jesus with our actions. We honored him with how we participated. Lord, we're disciples, your followers in a democracy. And so may we represent you and your heart. And at the end, may we have peace that our lives honored you. Lord, I just thank you for your goodness. And I just want to say today, Lord, that, um, that this nation and every other nation can be shaken, but your kingdom can never be shaken. It's sure and absolute. And that's where our help comes from, is from the Lord. And so I just pray today, even as we go back into worship right now, Father, that the assurance that you are in control, sovereignly ruling, would fall on every heart. And no matter what chaos they're feeling in their offices or in their families, they would sense that you are in control and able to lead them through all. I bless them in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I hope you enjoyed this message you just heard. For more information and other content, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and hit that bell icon as well so you can be notified every time we upload something new on our channel. Now, while you're here, go ahead and check out past messages and other videos, and we'll see you next time.